Gilbert Read for LibriVox.org by Alice Christoph Part 1. The Garden Above the city hung the moon, Right o'er a plot of ground, Where flowers and orchard trees were fenced, With lofty walls around. Twas Gilbert's garden, There, to-night, a while he walked alone, And, tired with sedentary toil, Mused where the moonlight shone. This garden, in a city heart, Lay still as houseless wild, Though many windowed mansion fronts Were round it closely piled. But thick their walls, and those within Lived lives by noise and stirred, Like wafting of an angel's wing, Time's flight by them was heard. Some soft piano notes alone Were sweet as faintly given, Where ladies doubtless cheered the hearth with song, that winter even, the city's many mingled sounds rose like the hum of ocean. They rather lulled the heart than roused its pulse to faster motion. Gilbert has paced the single walk an hour, yet is not weary, and though it be a winter night, he feels nor cold nor dreary. The prime of life is in his veins, and sends his blood fast flowing, and fancy's fervour warms the thoughts now in his bosom glowing. Those thoughts recur to early love, or what he love would name, though haply Gilbert's secret deeds might other title claim. Such theme not oft his mind absorbs, he to the world clings fast, and too much for the present lives to linger o'er the past. But now the evening's deep repose has glided to his soul, that moonlight falls on memory and shows her fading scroll. One name appears in every line, the gentle rays shine o'er, and still he smiles and still repeats that one name, Eleanor. There is no sorrow in his smile, no kindness in his tone. The triumph of a selfish heart speaks coldly there alone. He says, She loved me more than life, and truly it was sweet to see so fair a woman kneel in bondage at my feet. There was a sort of quiet bliss to be so deeply loved, to gaze on trembling eagerness and sit myself unmoved. And when it pleased my pride to grant at last some rare caress, to feel the fever of that hand my fingers deigned to press, Twas sweet to see her strive to hide what every glance revealed, Endowed the while with desperate might her destiny to wield. I knew myself no perfect man, nor as she deemed divine. I knew that I was glorious, but by her reflected shine. Her youth, her native energy, her powers new-born and fresh, Twas these with Godhead sanctified my sensual frame of flesh. Yet, like a god, did I descend at last to meet her love, And like a god, I then withdrew to my own heaven above. And never more could she invoke my presence to her sphere. No prayer, no plaint, no cry of hers could win my awful ear. I knew her blinded constancy would ne'er my deeds betray, And calm in conscience, whole in heart, I went my tranquil way. Yet sometimes I still feel a wish, the fond and flattering pain of passion's anguish to create in her young breast again. Bright was the lustre of her eyes when they caught fire from mine. If I had power, this very hour again I'd light their shine. But where she is, or how she lives, I have no clue to know. I've heard she long my absence pined and left her home in woe. But busied then in gathering gold, as I am busied now, I could not turn from such pursuit to weep a broken vow. Nor could I give to fatal risk the fame I ever prized. Even now I fear that precious fame is too much compromised. An inward trouble dims his eye, some riddle he would solve, some method to unloose a knot his anxious thoughts revolve. He pensive, leans against a tree, a leafy evergreen, 
the boughs, the moonlight, intercept and hide him like a screen. He starts, the tree shakes with his tremor, yet nothing near him passed. He hurries up the garden alley in strangely sudden haste. With shaking hand he lifts the latchet, steps o'er the threshold stone. The heavy door slips from his fingers, it shuts, and he is gone. What touched, transfixed, appalled his soul? A nervous thought no more. To sink like stone in placid pool, and calm close smoothly o'er. Part two. The parlour. Warm is the parlour atmosphere, serene the lamp's soft light. The vivid embers, red and clear, proclaim a frosty night. Books, varied, on the table lie, three children o'er them bend, and all with curious, eager eye the turning leaf attend. Picture and tale alternately, their simple hearts delight, and interest deep and tempered glee illume their aspects bright. The parents, from their fireside place, behold that pleasant scene, and joy is on the mother's face, pride in the father's mien. As Gilbert sees his blooming wife, beholds his children fair, no thought has he of transient strife or past, though piercing fear. The voice of happy infancy lisps sweetly in his ear. His wife, with pleased and peaceful eye, sits kindly smiling near. The fire glows on her silken dress, and shows its ample grace, and warmly tints each hazel tress curled soft around her face. The beauty that in youth he wooed, is beauty still unfaded, the brow of ever placid mood, no churlish grief has shaded. Prosperity in Gilbert's home abides the guest of years. Their want or discord never come, and seldom toil or tears. The carpets bear the peaceful print of comfort's velvet tread, and golden gleams from plenty sent in every nook are shed. The very silken spaniel seems of quiet ease to tell as near its mistress' feet it dreams, sunk in a cushion's swell. And smiles seem native to the eyes of those sweet children three. They have but looked on tranquil skies, and know not misery. Alas, that misery should come in such an hour as this! Why could she not so calm a home a little longer miss? But she is now within the door, her steps advancing glide, a sullen shade has crossed the floor, she stands at Gilbert's side. She lays her hand upon his heart, it bounds with agony, his fireside chair shakes with the start that shook the garden tree. His wife towards the children looks, she does not mark his mien, the children bending o'er their books, his terror have not seen. In his own home, by his own hearth, he sits in solitude, and circled round with light and mirth, cold horror chills his blood. His mind would hold with desperate clutch the scene that round him lies. No, changed, as by some wizard's touch the present prospect flies. A tumult vague, a viewless strife, his futile struggles crush. Twixt him and his, an unknown life and unknown feelings rush. He sees, but scarce can language paint the tissue fancy weaves, for words oft give but echo faint of thoughts the mind conceives. Noise, tumult strange and darkness dim, efface both light and quiet. No shape is in those shadows grim, no voice in that wild riot. Sustained and strong, a wondrous blast above and round him blows, a greenish gloom, dense overcast, each moment denser grows. He nothing knows, nor clearly sees, resistance checks his breath, the high, impetuous, ceaseless breeze blows on him cold as death. 
and still the undulating gloom mocks sight with formless motion was such sensation jonah's doom gulfed in the depths of ocean streaking the air the nameless vision fast driven deep sounding flows oh whence its source and what its mission how will its terrors close long sweeping rushing vast and void the universe it swallows and still the dark devouring tide a typhoon tempest follows more slowly it rolls its furious race sinks to a solemn gliding the stunning roar the wind's wild chase to stillness are subsiding and slowly borne along a form the shapeless chaos varies poised in the eddy to the storm before the eyed tarries a woman drowned sunk in the deep on a long wave reclining the circling waters crystal sweep like glass her shape enshrining her pale dead face to gilbert turned seems as in sleep reposing a feeble light now first discerned the features well disclosing no effort from the haunted air the ghastly scene could banish that hovering wave arrested there rolled throbbed but did not vanish if gilbert upward turned his gaze he saw the ocean shadow if he looked down the endless seas lay green as summer meadow and straight before the pale corpse lay upborne by air or billow so near he could have touched the spray that churned around its pillow the hollow anguish of the face had moved a fiend to sorrow not death's fixed calm could raise the trace of suffering's deep-worn furrow all moved a strong returning blast the mass of waters raising bore wave and passive carcass past while gilbert yet was gazing deep in her isle conceiving womb it seemed the ocean thundered and soon by realms of rushing gloom were sere and phantom sundered then swept some timbers from a wreck on following surges riding then seaweed in the turbid rack uptorn went slowly gliding the horrid shade by slow degrees a beam of light defeated and then the roar of raving seas fast far and faint retreated and all was gone gone like a mist course billows tempest wreck three children close to gilbert pressed and clung around his neck good night good night the prattlers said and kissed their father's cheek twas now the hour their quiet bed and placid rest to seek the mother with her offspring goes to hear their evening prayer she naught of gilbert's vision knows and naught of his despair yet pitying god abridge the time of anguish now his fate though haply great has been his crime thy mercy too is great gilbert at length uplifts his head bent for some moments low and there is neither grief nor dread upon his subtle brow for well can he his feelings task and well his looks command his features well his heart can mask with smiles and smoothness bland gilbert has reasoned with his mind he says twas all a dream he strives his inward sight to blind against truth's inward beam he pitied not that shadowy thing when it was flesh and blood nor now can pity's balmy spring refresh his arid mood and if that dream has spoken truth thus musingly he says if eleanor be dead in sooth such chance the shock repays a net was woven round my feet i scarce could further go ere shame had forced a fast retreat dishonour brought me low conceal her then deep silent sea give her a secret grave she sleeps in peace and i am free no longer terror slave and a homage still from all the world shall greet my spotless name since surges break and waves are curled 
above its threat and shame. Part 3. The Welcome Home Above the city hangs the moon, some clouds are boding rain. Gilbert, erewhile on journey gone, to-night comes home again. Ten years have passed above his head, each year has brought him gain. His prosperous life has smoothly sped, without or tear or stain. Tis somewhat late, the city clock's twelve deep vibrations tall, as Gilbert at the portal knocks, which is his journey's goal. The street is still and desolate, the moon hid by a cloud. Gilbert, impatient, will not wait, his second knock peals loud. The clocks are hushed, there's not a light in any window nigh, and not a single planet bright looks from the clouded sky. The air is raw, the rain descends, a bitter north wind blows, his cloak the traveller scarce defends, will not the door unclose? He knocks the third time, and the last, his summons now they hear, within a footstep hurrying fast is heard approaching near. The bolt is drawn, the clanking chain falls to the floor of stone, and Gilbert to his heart will strain his wife and children soon. The hand that lifts the latchet holds a candle to his sight, and Gilbert on the step beholds a woman clad in white. Lo, water from her dripping dress runs on the streaming floor, from every dark and clinging tress the drops incessant pour. There's none but her to welcome him. She holds the candle high, and motionless in form and limb, stands cold and silent nigh. There's sand and seaweed on her robe, her hollow eyes are blind, no pulse in such a frame can throb, no life is there defined. Gilbert turned ashy white, but still his lips vouchsafed no cry. He spurred his strength and master will to pass the figure by, but moving slow, it faced him straight, it would not flinch nor quail. Then first did Gilbert's strength abate, his stony firmness quail. He sank upon his knees and prayed, the shape stood rigid there. He called aloud for human aid, no human aid was near. An accent strange did thus repeat, heaven's stern but just decree. The measure thou to her didst meet, to thee shall measured be. Gilbert sprang from his bended knees, by the pale spectre pushed, and, wild as one whom demons sees, up the whole staircase rushed, entered his chamber, near the bed, sheathed steel and firearms hung, impelled by maniac purpose dread, he chose those stores among. Across his throat a keen-edged knife with vigorous hand he drew. The wound was wide, his outraged life rushed rash and redly through. And thus died, by a shameful death, a wise and worldly man, who never drew but selfish breath since first his life began. Kara This recording is in the public domain.